Now I'm going to call onto the stage the mo a motivational speaker who is actually a non-speaker. So the most motivational non-speaker that we have and why he is known as the silent conductor. I've had a privilege of being at one of his sessions. All he has is a baton in hand and he conducts orchestras like no other on earth. I'm going to hand you over to someone who has years of experience teaching people how to engage in team building without speaking at all. But for today, he's opted to speak to us rather than be silent. I hand you over to Steve Barnett. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to start with a story that my friend Steph Duplessis likes a lot. When I was booked to play at the Royal Albert Hall in London. I was doing a gig there and I was looking. I was looking at a map, trying to find out where it was, walking around Hyde Park. And I see a guy there with a cello on a bandstand. So I go up to him and I say, excuse me, can you tell me how do I get to the Royal Albert Hall? And he says to me, practice, man, practice. Funny story, but we'll get back to it. In my early 20s, I took a backpack to travel and see the world. In the backpack, I had a sleeping bag, but I also had an old clarinet. I still have it. Now, I never played the clarinet very well, but when I took it out, people would look and they'd think, oh, this guy looks interesting. And sometimes they'd invite me to come and jam with them. And I would. Now, jam is a kind of musical get together where people of different musical abilities come in. It's unstructured. But sometimes within the music that happens, there's, there's something clicks and there's a magic that happens. And I always wanted to share that. Anyway, at one time I was uh, hitchhiking across British Columbia in Canada. And my ride dropped me off at a T junction and there was nothing in sight, not a building, not a settlement <clears throat> and hardly any cars. So I decided that I was going to try and hitchhike both ways, north and south, and see where that took me. And I call that my T-junction moment. And so I took out my clarinet and started to play while I waited. And I put out my thumb and a van stopped, a truck, and he was going north. So I took the ride and I ended up hitchhiking to Alaska and it was magical. It was midsummer, the sun never set going through trees and past lakes. And at a certain day, I was standing outside of uh, Mount McKinley National Park with my thumb out. And here comes a VW microbus coming down the road. He stops, I climb in and off we go. The driver was like the seriously cool guy. He was cool in like a 1970s kind of cool way. He was so cool. He never even asked me where I was going. And I was so cool, I never even asked him where he was headed. But we drove on down the road and eventually we introduced each other. I told him I was Steve and let's call him Chuck. And Chuck told me that he'd been traveling from California down to Mexico and all the way up to Alaska. And now he was headed down to see some friends of his in Oregon that I want to join him. He was going for the 4th of July. Now this was 1976. It was the bicentennial. It was a big deal in the US. And I said, yes, I joined him. Let's go. So we traveled for a few days, maybe a couple of weeks. And on the way, I realized that he was acting rather strangely. At one point, he stopped at a telephone booth when we still had to use those things. And he said, <clears throat> he came back and he said, he just phoned his friends in uh, Oregon and told him that he was traveling with Bob Dylan and he was going to bring him down to for the 4th of July. So I thought this was kind of odd, but I was having an adventure. And then he started to tell people that I was Bob Dylan, people who we met along the road. And people would say, no, this is crazy. He doesn't look like Bob Dylan, doesn't sound like Bob Dylan. But Chuck said so in such a convincing way because he actually believed it. He would say to them, no, it doesn't look like it because he can change his image. He's got magic. 
Now, he said so with such commitment that people really started to doubt what was right in front of them. And some people would even come up and shake my hand and, and feel as if they had touched something great. And that was really strange. And it got me thinking, you know, what if, what if a parent told a child something with such commitment, something that was patently incorrect, but with such commitment that the child believed it? What if a corporation sold a product that was defective, but sold it with such commitment that people bought it? What if a religion taught something with such commitment that people believed anything? What if president of a country? But let me get back to my story. I, uh, we traveled and we got to Oregon and Chuck introduced me to his friends. He said, this is Bob. And they looked at me as if I was strange. And I showed them my passport to, just to clear things up. And Chuck kind of looked on like, well, you can think whatever you like, but I know the truth. Anyway, uh, next day, 4th of July, in an open field next to a river. And I meet this girl and her name is Kathy. And Kathy, Kathy and I have uh, a wonderful afternoon together and evening, excuse me. And then we say our goodbyes because Chuck and I are headed on down back to, on to California. Now, along this uh, country road, the van breaks down. It's uh, next to a, a farmhouse. There's a road going up to the farmhouse, like a long driveway, kind of a T-junction. And it turns out that the house is where Kathy lives. Now, <clears throat> this van had traveled from Mexico up to Alaska, thousands of kilometers, but it breaks down coincidentally right in front of the house where Kathy lives. Anyway, we go into the house, we use the phone to call the breakdown service. Breakdown service comes, takes the van away, they fix the van, Chuck carries on down to California and I stay with Kathy. It was 44 years ago and Kathy and I are still together. After returning to South Africa, I had a number of different T-junction moments. One of which was when an architect friend asked me if I could build a wooden built-in unit for a client. Now I'd never really done that kind of thing before, but I said, yes, I could. I studied the plans for a couple of days. I went out and borrowed some tools and I made a unit that was very beautiful. The client liked it and I enjoyed what I was doing. So I spent the next 15 to 20 years doing woodwork and really enjoying it. And then my daughters were, were young teenagers and I wanted to do something. I wanted to change that would inspire them. Uh, I happened to be jamming. I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I happened to be jamming with friends again. And along with jamming, I was doing some drum circles. And I noticed that people who were not musicians who would join in with the drum circles would get empowered. And I thought this is a great idea for team building. And I started doing this with uh, using like an African uh, rhythmic philosophy behind it. I, in fact, uh, I, I mentioned it to my wife and she smiled and I went out and bought 30 drums and my teenage daughters cried. And uh, I locked up my workshop and I started doing these uh, team building uh, workshops. I, I locked up my, my, my wood workshop and started doing team building workshops. And this went quite well. And shortly after this, somebody heard about it and a production company came to me and said, can you do this with 5,000 people? Now, as far as I know and knew, this had never been done in history, but I said, yes, not really knowing how I would do it. Uh, 5,000 African drums were made for this. And I would lie in bed at night, night after night, envisioning how I could do this. This was for a mining company. There were going to be executives, underground workers. I had to engage all of them. So I thought I would do this without speaking, just by demonstrating. And it really worked. 5,000 African drums playing together in unison. I've never heard anything so powerful. After that, I fashioned myself as a motivational non-speaker. And the professional speakers 
found it amusing and liked the concept and they accepted me into their ranks. And so I joined the speaker circuit and I also get invited to be part of SA's best speakers, which is amazing. And then I got booked for a gig at the Albert Hall. You thought I was joking. The part about the cellist is the joke, but I did get booked. I made three and a half thousand tuned percussion instruments, shipped them over there. And from the stage where some of my musical heroes and icons have played, I conducted an audience in their business attire, uh, attire and they made the music and it was magical. Now, being around what, doing what I've been doing, I've come across some of the most inspirational speakers and inspirational people. But sometimes the best inspiration comes from close to home, from family. From my wife, Kathy, who looked at 30 drums and said, go for it. My eldest daughter, who said to me one day, you know, dad, you don't think that I'm competitive, but what I'm interested in, I wanna be the best. My younger daughter, who said to me one day, you know, dad, in our family, we don't work for other people. We start our own thing. And she did. And my four year old grandson, sitting on his mother's knee the other day says, you know, mom, when I grow up, I don't want to be ordinary. I want to be interesting. Wow. Me too. We are at a kind of global tea junction moment. We don't know where the future is going to be, what the new normal might be. And I too am at a tea junction moment. I've still got a sleeping bag, but now I've got a saxophone. I don't play it too well, but it's bigger and shinier than a clarinet. Thank you. <laughs>